So we are going to talk about the first isomorphism theorem. Now oftentimes proofs of the first isomorphism theorem will start with some group homomorphism phi from G to H, and then they'll use some tricks to turn this map into an isomorphism. But it often feels like those changes that we apply to this map phi are designed on purpose to turn the homomorphism into an isomorphism. My goal in this video is to show that we don't need to use those tricks. We don't need to design the map to turn phi into an isomorphism. The first isomorphism theorem is actually a natural consequence of just considering the pre-image map that we get from this original function phi. First of all, let's say that we have two elements x and g. These are elements of the original group g, which is the domain of phi. And let's say that phi of x is equal to phi of g. Now, one thing we can do here is multiply both sides of this equation on the left by phi of g inverse. These two are elements of the group H, so this element has an inverse phi of g inverse. So we get that phi of g inverse times phi of x is equal to phi of g inverse times phi of g. Of course, that's just the identity element in the group H. Now, because phi is a homomorphism, phi of g inverse is the same thing as phi of g inverse. So in other words, we can take this negative one and move it from the outside of phi to the inside. And on this side here, we have phi of g inverse now times phi of x. But since phi is a homomorphism, that's the same as phi of g inverse times x. So this is equal to the identity of the group H. And this statement that phi of g inverse x is equal to the identity element that's exactly the same as saying that g inverse x is in the kernel of phi. Because by definition, the kernel of phi is the set of all elements that phi maps to the identity. So these two statements are equivalent just by the definition of the kernel of phi. Now, if g inverse x is an element of the kernel of phi, then we can say that g inverse x is equal to k. So k is just some element in the kernel of phi. If we take this equation and multiply by g on the left, then what we get is x equals g times k, because g and g inverse are going to cancel out. So x is equal to g times k, and k is in the kernel of phi. What that means is that x is an element of g times the kernel of phi. So this is a coset of this subgroup, the kernel of phi. So we just showed that if phi of x equals phi of g, then that implies that x is an element of g times the kernel of phi. This is a coset of the kernel. And the implication also works in the opposite direction. Because if x is an element of g times the kernel of phi, that means we can write x as g times k, just like this. And then phi of x is equal to phi of g k, which is equal to phi of g times phi of k, because phi is a group homomorphism. But by definition, k is an element of the kernel of phi, and so phi of k is just the identity element, and therefore this equals phi of g. So if x is an element of g times the kernel of phi, then phi of x equals phi of g. And therefore, this statement and this statement are equivalent. So now we've established that phi of x equals phi of g if and only if x is an element of the coset g times the kernel of phi. Now what I want to do is consider what is this set of elements x in the group g such that phi of x equals phi of g. Well, an element of this group satisfies phi of x equals phi of g if and only if it's an element of g times the kernel of phi. So the set of all elements x with phi of x equals phi of g is the same as the set of all elements x in g times the kernel of phi. And that's just the same as the set itself, g times the kernel of phi. So each of these cosets, g times the kernel of phi, that is a set of elements in the group that all have the same output. This is exactly the set of elements in g that have the output phi of g. Now, let's say that we have some element h that's in the image of phi. So what it means to be in the image is that there's some element g such that phi of g equals h. And if this is true, then the set of all elements of g 
satisfying phi of x equals h, since h is just phi of g, this is g times the kernel of phi. So what we've just shown is that if h is an element of the image of phi, then the set of elements that map to h is this coset g times the kernel of phi. But the set of all elements that map to h, this is exactly the pre-image phi inverse of h. So the pre-image of a single element h in the image of phi is a coset of the kernel of phi. So now we've shown that the pre-image of any element h is a coset of the kernel of phi. Now since phi is a group homomorphism, the kernel of phi is a normal subgroup of the original group g, which means that the collection of all of these cosets forms a group, which is the quotient group g mod the kernel of phi. So this statement here shows that the pre-image map phi inverse that takes an element to its pre-image in the group g, this is a map from the image of phi to the quotient group g mod the kernel of phi. It takes every element from the image of phi to a coset in this quotient group. So the pre-image map phi inverse is a function from the image of phi to g mod the kernel of phi. Now the image of phi is a subgroup of the group h, and g mod kernel of phi is also a group, it's the quotient group. So one question we might ask is, is phi inverse a group homomorphism? To check that, let's suppose we have two elements h1 and h2 that are in the image of phi. Now if these are in the image of phi, what that means is that there exists some element g1 of this group g with phi of g1 equals h1, and similarly there exists some g2 with phi of g2 equals h2. And because phi is a group homomorphism, if phi of g1 equals h1 and phi of g2 equals h2, then phi of g1 times g2 equals h1 times h2. Now, what do each of these mean for the pre-image map phi inverse? Well, if phi of g1 equals h1, then g1 is in the pre-image of h1. So phi inverse of h1, this is the set of all elements that map to h1, and that's the same as g1 times the kernel of phi. Similarly, the pre-image of h2, this is all of the elements that map to h2, and g2 is one of those elements, so this is the coset g2 times the kernel of phi. And similarly, phi inverse of h1 times h2 is g1 g2 times the kernel of phi. So now we need to check what is phi inverse of h1 times phi inverse of h2. Well, we know phi inverse of h1, that's g1 times the kernel of phi, and phi inverse of h2 is g2 times the kernel of phi. And the way multiplication in the quotient group works is the product of these two is g1 g2 times the kernel of phi. But that's exactly the same as phi inverse of h1 h2. So now we know that phi inverse of h1 times phi inverse of h2 equals phi inverse of h1 h2, therefore phi inverse is a group homomorphism. So we've checked that phi inverse is a group homomorphism, but we can go a step further and ask, is phi inverse an isomorphism? Now to check that, an isomorphism is a group homomorphism that is bijective, meaning it's injective and surjective. So we need to check, is the pre-image map injective and is it surjective? Well, it turns out that the pre-image map is always injective for any function. So we don't even need to use the fact that phi is a homomorphism between groups. As long as phi is a function between sets, the pre-image map phi inverse is always going to be injective. And here's why. Let's say we take h1 and h2 being in the image of phi. And let's suppose that phi inverse of h1 equals phi inverse of h2. Well, because h1 and h2 are in the image of phi, these pre-images are non-empty. So there exists some element, let's call it g, that's in this pre-image phi inverse of h1. 
Now, what it means for g to be in the preimage of h1, by definition, that means that phi of g equals h1. But g is also in the preimage of h2, because these two preimages are equal. And if g is in the preimage of h2, then that means phi of g equals h2. So now we have phi of g equals h1 and phi of g equals h2, which means h1 equals h2. So if phi inverse of h1 equals phi inverse of h2, then h1 equals h2. Therefore, the preimage map is injective. The last thing we need to do is check that phi inverse is surjective. So to do that, we can take some arbitrary element of the codomain, g mod the kernel of phi, and check whether there's an element in the image of phi that maps to it. We can write an arbitrary element over here as the coset g times kernel of phi, where g is some element of the original group. It's our coset representative. Now, what I want to do is consider the element phi inverse of phi of g. Now, phi of g is an element of the image of phi. So we can use this definition right here. The preimage of phi of g is exactly the set of all elements x in the group g, such that phi of x equals this element right here, phi of g. But what we showed at the beginning of the video is that this is equal to g times the kernel of phi. So phi inverse of phi of g equals g times kernel of phi. And we can do this for every single coset g times kernel of phi. This phi of g is going to be in the image of phi, which means that for every single coset, we can find an element in the image of phi that maps to that coset, which means that this preimage map phi inverse is surjective onto the quotient group. So we've now shown that the preimage map phi inverse that goes from the image of phi to the quotient g mod the kernel of phi is a group homomorphism that is injective and surjective. So this preimage map is an isomorphism. And that gives us that the image of phi is isomorphic to g mod the kernel of phi, which is the first isomorphism theorem. So that's how we can prove the first isomorphism theorem without doing any tricks or setting up the maps intentionally to try to turn it into an isomorphism. It turns out that any time we have a group homomorphism, the pre-image map associated with that homomorphism, this is the isomorphism from image of phi to g mod the kernel of phi. It's a completely natural map to consider, and it gives us the exact theorem that we want.